The first thing I want to say to each and every one of you is that actually you hold a power. You may not realize that you have power, but you do. You have the power to dream. You have the power to take those dreams and decide whether or not you can shape them into ambition. You can set your own terms. And if you take that power to dream, that power to set ambition, you then have the power to plan and plot the route ahead and how you are going to fulfill that ambition. And you have the power to find people to help you on that way. And maybe those people don't realize that they're helping you because you're simply looking at them as role models, observing how they do things, how they communicate, how they inspire, how they motivate. And in looking at these role models, you may find that you are simply inspired and motivated by observing. I have often found in my life people that I have admired when you are courageous enough to actually go up to them and say, I'd like to learn from you, can you help me? Most people I have found are flattered by that. So don't be afraid to ask for advice. Don't be afraid to ask someone you admire to coach you, to mentor you. And the final power that all of that adds up to is that you have the power to lean in, to take those choices and make it happen. Now, as some of you may know, I am an EPO girl. And if a young girl who left Malaysia when she was eight years old, uh, I was born in Ipoh, and the first time I met Prime Minister Najib, and he asked me, how did that happen? I said, in the usual way. <laughs> um, he wasn't too sure what to make of that, fortunately. He laughed, just as you have. And I grew up a typical Malaysian childhood. I went to the local uh, when I started at Standard One, which was the only sort of... Um, I left when I was eight, so I remember one, one year of Standard One in Malaysia. Uh, like many of you, I suspect, I wore my blue pinafore dress, the white shirt, my white canvas pumps. Um, childhood in Ipoh was around aunties and uncles and eating all the wonderful festivals that Malaysia has where we celebrate each other's cultures. And that is so important here. And actually, in Malaysia, from that background, you should all already be global citizens. You know, that old adage of the tourism Malaysia advert, Malaysia truly Asia, you were ahead of the game. Never lose that. So, uh, my family migrated to the United Kingdom, where I grew up and found myself as an 18-year-old deciding to take a gap year. And my father was a wise man and he said, look, if you think the bank of daddy is going to finance <laughs> your year off before you go to university, um, it's not going to happen. But I'll do a deal with you. If you go and work for a few months, Every pound you save, I'll match it with a pound. So that's why when I was 18, after my A-levels, I found myself working in the Foreign Commonwealth Office, which is our equivalent of Wisma Putra in London, with the intention of maybe working for three or four months. It was a very junior clerical job. I did filing, I did photocopying, I made tea for the boss. <laughs> And I met all these very senior diplomats who were talking about their careers in the British diplomatic service. Uh, they told me about their travels, the places they'd been, my own peer group of young people who'd come in to do those clerical jobs, really looking forward to, after two years in London, going overseas on their first overseas assignment. And I had deferred my place to read law at Bristol University 
and that was my plan, I suddenly thought, there's an opportunity here, rather than a, a few months of travel before I go to university, I could actually have a career. Now, I remember when I told my parents, I think I will stay working at the Foreign Office. Um, you will know it. Uh, parents who want the best for their children, and mum and dad said, yes, but you have to go to university like your elder sister, who's doing really, really well. That's something I lived with. All of us. If you have older siblings, you know what I'm talking about. And you feel, I must, I must follow, follow the pattern set by those in my family who've gone before me. And so I said, no, this is something I think I want to do. And sometimes when you're 18, you're a little bit rebellious. You haven't quite decided what you want to do in life. So they said, okay, but if you're going to do this, then do it seriously. You have entered the great British diplomatic service at the bottom rung of a very tall ladder. And let me remind you, 30 plus years ago, the British diplomatic service, I'm gonna describe it to you, because this is important. When I say you can lean in, you have the power, you can realize your potential. Uh, when you look around you and you look up the ladder, you might not see people you recognize. We do not see enough women at the top of the ladder. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office that I joined was majority male. All the bosses from middle management up were mainly white Anglo-Saxon men. <laughs> Lovely men, but nonetheless, that was what it looked like when I looked up the ladder. The majority, 70%, these are statistics that were true at the time, 70% of those senior managers went either to Oxford or Cambridge, and about 70% of those Oxford and Cambridge uh, men went to a tiny handful of the best private schools in the UK. So if you were a young woman of 18 looking at the hierarchy of my organization, you'd think, one, I'm not a man, I'm not white Anglo-Saxon, being mixed race myself. I haven't gone to university, let alone Oxford or Cambridge. And I didn't go to one of those very fine private schools in the UK. I'm never really going to be one of those. That's what you could think. But I think I was blessed with parents who actually had their own businesses. They made their lives, they made their professions, they created their own environment, and they all said to me, you can be what you want to be. In fact, that was the first time I was told that I had power. <laughs> so I determined that this would be my career. Um, and I looked around me at people who were really good, who admired, and I tried to mimic them. In the Foreign Commonwealth Office of those days, the art of drafting and writing really well, having a range of vocabulary, being able to set out policy and strategy, the arguments for them, uh, the reasons why you would go down a particular route, uh, the pros and cons, uh, the analysis that was needed in order to inform uh, documents like that. Uh, it was something I knew I had to learn. So the best way to do it was actually to read some of the finest examples of drafting, political analysis, strategy papers, policy papers, and actually to try to translate that into the way I did things. And you find a boss who will help you do that. And I have to say to a lot of the women uh, in the room, one of the early lessons I learned then and I understand why. The few women that were sort of on the cusp of senior management weren't actually very nice. They weren't very kind, and they didn't really like younger women who were ambitious. <laughs> I, I can see some of you know what I'm talking about. You may have experienced this yourself. And I remember thinking then, if I ever get to the most senior positions, I'm going to get there not like them, and when I do get there, I'm not going to behave like them. And 
And I think that revolves around a word that I like to think is really important in leadership. And there's an issue about why women are successful. It's not because we behave like men. Actually, we have to take our own attributes and make them strengths and make them assets. And I think one thing that women are better at, sorry guys, but you need to be better at too, is compassion and empathy and emotional intelligence. I mean, after all, it is women in the main who have children and nurture and take most of the childcare duties. It is that same set of attributes. Uh, it is also the share of looking after elderly relatives. It is those same attributes. But how do you flip that into the workplace? The way we can inspire and motivate must have those ingredients too. So I learned fast, and I found myself at 21 on my first overseas posting to Pakistan. Um, turning up at the British High Commission in Islamabad. And there too, the sort of the emotional intelligence bit, how to operate in different environments, I do think another C word, cultural understanding, is really important. Whether it is institutional, organisational, or it is the work environment you find yourself in. Understanding the culture of the place the culture of the organization, the culture of the country is really important to be effective. And in all of this, I think attributes like courage that are normally associated with men, women are hugely courageous. Um, I was recently at a conference in London that my organization supported with a wonderful organization in the UK called Women of the Future. And Women of the Future targets the 25 to 35 year old group to help them be inspired by role models who have trod the path before them. And there are a whole range of wonderful speakers. And one speaker from Cameroon uh, used an old African proverb if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And I think that is so important. You know, as a boss and a leader myself, I can't achieve anything without my team. Even as a young, ambitious woman, I could not achieve what I wanted to do if it wasn't for others, if it wasn't for support, if it wasn't for colleagues that I worked with, if it wasn't being part of a team. So I think that concept of working collegiately is really important. And competition is good. Uh, in my organization nowadays, it's changed a lot, Promotion is through an assessment and development centre to qualify, uh, to serve a certain amount of time in your particular grade to gain the experience. But at the assessment and de development centre, one reason why people fail when the team exercises was the person who thought the way to show that I'm better is actually to push my own views, not allow others to speak, to show that I'm the bright one and actually not work with the group. And that was a reason for failure on that particular competence of teamwork. And being a leader doesn't mean you have to be the boss. You can lead thinking, you can actually upward manage. I often say to my team in KL, don't forget, I enjoy a bit of upward management. And I mean it, because how else can I be a better boss? unless I understand how I am seen. And that brings me to a re another important thing for you to be really successful. You have to have a level of self-awareness. When we look in the mirror, 
we see this man or woman, hopefully it is a woman if you're a woman looking in the mirror, <laughs> and vice versa, but you see this woman looking back at you. She looks just like you. And you're thinking, do I like her? Actually, I know her very well. I know what she's good at. I know what she thinks she's good at. But what many of us aren't so good at is understanding actually the area where we need to improve. Our impact on others. When I walk into a room, what effect do I have? When I talk to someone, do they feel good about it? The way, the tone of my voice, my body language, does that relax and make people feel comfortable? And when I'm a boss and I'm giving direction, am I an empowering boss or am I a dictator? Which one do you think works better? Um, so I think a level of self-understanding and awareness and think about yourself objectively. And when you've worked out what you're really great at, and actually you have some external evidence for it, work hard at keeping that up, indeed, to see whether or not you can push the bar further. And in the area where you're not so confident, work out a plan how you address that. I used to hate public speaking. I used to get very nervous before I came up on a stage. So the other tip that I would give you, the only way to become comfortable about something is to put yourself in that uncomfortable space. Deal with it, address it, practice it. Look, if it was me, my example, I asked for opportunities to present in public, whether they were small meetings or big crowds. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. The more you do it, the better it's like learning to ride a bicycle. The first time you're on it, it's a bit wobbly. Even when you have the stabilizers. A vivid memory from my childhood in Ipo was the day that my dad took the stabilizers off the back of my little bicycle. And he tricked me. He said, right, today I think we're going to do it. Here's your bike, and he was standing behind it like it. And he said, if you get on it, we'll push you. And forward and don't worry the stabilizers are still there so off I went and I thought wow this is good and I said dad you can take the stabilizers off and he was 100 yards down our drive holding the stabilizers <laughs> so sometimes you can do things even if you think you can't the only way to find out is to put yourself out there and try and try again failure is not a problem failure is a strength but remember this, this was another great phrase that I heard at this conference. If you are going to fail, fail forward. The lessons that you learn from that failure actually help you to move forward, help you to progress, help you to put right what you didn't quite get right. Most successful people I meet, whether in the public or the private sector, and over my career, I have met some of the most amazing corporate leaders, people who started their own businesses, who tell you time and time again about the first attempt, the second attempt, the third. Some of them had several attempts before they finally succeeded. If you talk to one of our great um, British icons in the business world, Sir Richard Branson, uh, Virgin Airlines, is one of his big companies. He, he ran a market store and was selling second-hand vinyl LPs. He wasn't particularly good and he had to find new ways uh, to improve. And now he heads this multinational corporation and is hugely successful that he can uh, have hobbies like build a, a craft that will take space tourism uh, people up into space. And there's an example of one of his projects that hasn't succeeded the first time round, but he's still at it. So do not be afraid to fail, but if you do, fail forward. So self-awareness, courage, compassion, uh, don't be frightened. And 
You have to have confidence. This is very hard to learn. I suspect for a lot of younger women in the organization that you are in, uh, as you aspire, are you confident? Do you project confidence? Guys do this better than us. Guys often say, you know, when an opportunity comes up, I'll do that, I can do that, whether or not they can. <laughs> Guys will tell you that they are the best superstar in their particular field, whether or not they are. <laughs> they get those opportunities, they learn, and many of them then become the superstars. Women have to do the same. Put yourself out there, and maybe you'll get rejected. But don't take those rejections as knocks that push you back. Take those rejections as an opportunity to fire you up and come back even stronger with greater conviction that you can do it. Think about the reasons why you might not have had that opportunity. Think about whether or not you prepared your pitch or your application or when you spoke to the boss and said, I want to do that why perhaps the boss didn't. Ask the boss, why didn't I get that opportunity? Because next time I would like to and I would like to learn. That is really important. Um, don't be uh, self-effacing. I mean, it's a beautiful attribute. Use it from time to time, but when you know the effect that you're going to have. So think about how you can become more confident how you can project confidence. A um, few tips from me in those early days of my career. You know, what did this young woman who didn't go to university, um, what could she offer? And actually by demonstrating what you do and the impact you have, uh, when I knew that there were pieces of work to be done, perhaps, you know, to give you an example, to write a first draft before you were asked for it because you know that that is coming down the pipeline. Um, actually, I've written a little policy proposal because I know senior management are thinking about this thing. It'll help get you noticed. And if I think about it, you know, the opportunities that came along to do something different, quite often we're frightened of stepping outside the career trajectory that people say is the only way to do it. That's the other challenge I would have. It's not the only way to do it. I know in my own organization, um, I took opportunities to have secondments outside the British Diplomatic Service. The world of business and trade was of real interest to me. And I thought, I work for the Diplomatic Service, but for me to understand the world of trade and industry, I will go and get a secondment in our Department of Trade and Industry. And at that time, it wasn't that common for British diplomats to go and work in other government departments. Because, you know, the Foreign Commonwealth Office has sort of a very elitist view of itself. Um, but a job came up that I wanted to do and I thought it would be good for me, and off I went to do it on secondment. And I remember a lot of my colleagues said, oh, it's career suicide. But at my level at the time in the Foreign Office, you had very limited management responsibilities for staff. Maybe two or three if you were lucky as a small team leader. In the equivalent grade in the Department of Trade and Industry, I had 60 staff. And that was what I used, was actually to learn how to manage larger teams. And I took that core competence when I returned to the Foreign Office and said, no one in my peer group, on average, has managed as many staff. And this is what we delivered. And then I took another opportunity to be seconded into our regional uh, government structure. And I was the Trade and Investment Director in the northwest of England, a little part of the UK covering Cumbria, Lancashire, Greater Manchester, Merseyside and Cheshire, population of 7 million people, a lot of very large British businesses based up there, like AstraZeneca, a lot of BAE aerospace supply chain. And I was interested to understand how businesses worked on the ground. This isn't typical British diplomatic type jobs. 
Uh, I had a flat in Liverpool city centre. My office was in Warrington, and I spent four days a week travelling around my patch, beautiful part of England, uh, visiting small and medium-sized companies who were either already exporting or looking to export. I had a team of 160 across the northwest of England, and I had a budget of six million pounds. And at the time, my grade was the equivalent of a first secretary. So if you think of your, if you know embassies here, it wasn't particularly senior grade. But nowhere in the British diplomatic service did any first secretary manage directly a budget of six million pounds and a team of 160 people. So again, my leadership, people management, budget management, my resource management skills were honed. And then we got smart. This was in the time when we could bid for money from Europe, from Brussels, match funding. So I doubled my budget to 12 million by bidding for European money to match each of the pounds that I had. And believe you me, if you can crack bidding for European funding, uh, it teaches you an awful lot. But the important thing was I learned about business sitting in the office of an MD of a small manufacturing company, understanding how they see the world. And this comes back to the emotional intelligence, the sort of compassion part. Um, and I learnt an, an awful lot there. And I remember once I was at a conference in London with my peer group, and someone said to me, Vicky, where are you at the moment? Which post are you in? And I said, actually, I'm based in Warrington, which is... There's no one from Warrington here, is there? <laughs> it's not the most beautiful town, but it has beautiful people. And I said, I'm in Warrington. And they said, which country is that in? <laughs> and I said, it's your own. <laughs> so actually, that reminds me of an another point. If you're really going to represent your organization or your country well, you better really know it. <laughs> I think it's appalling that British diplomats didn't know where Warrington is. I've made it a point of really understanding my own country, otherwise how else can you represent it overseas? Now I know time is running out, um, but the final example that I want to give you, uh, in, in both my time heading our Western India team in Mumbai in India as Deputy High Commissioner there, and also in my last job as High Commissioner to New Zealand, I faced and dealt with two major crises. Uh, some of you may remember the November 2008 terrorist attacks in Mumbai. About 160 people killed, about 700 injured. And for three days, downtown Mumbai was like a war zone. There was a group of 10. Initially, we didn't know how many people there were. Um, uh, killing people, firing off their guns, setting off bombs. That's one example of a crisis. Uh, man-made. In New Zealand, I was there during the time of the Christchurch earthquake, where Christchurch city centre was devastated, and actually the death toll was about the same as Mumbai. Uh, the injured were a few less, uh, but still over 500. One of the things we do in the British Foreign Service, and your Foreign Service will be the same, is that we go to help our people who are caught up in crisis. Now, these were dangerous, frightening environments to operate in. And leadership comes into a whole new focus when you're asking your staff to deploy into an environment like that, to find our dead and injured, to give them the help that they need, to work with the local authorities for their crisis response. Uh, in both scenarios, getting British expertise out, but most importantly, managing your own team. Asking my staff in both Mumbai and Christchurch to go to visit the A&E wards because that was one way to find our injured people. To deal with some pretty grisly and frightening stuff. You can't lead in crisis unless you have led well during normal day-to-day -day routine. You can't lead in crisis if you do not understand every member of your team, what they can withstand, what makes them tick, who's the right person 
to send to break the news to a husband work, waiting uh, for news on his wife's surgery to say, with the doctor, I'm sorry, she passed away. You need to know your people and what they can do. And they need to have absolute trust in you that you've made the right judgments in what it is you ask them to do. Uh, and that comes from many of the things that I've said. Compassion and empathy and courage, but actually clarity of vision and direction. I'm still working on those things now. By no means do I think I have achieved it. My message to all of you is that if a girl from Ipo could rise in the British diplomatic service to become a senior diplomat and return home to Malaysia as the British High Commissioner, each and every one of you, the men and the women in this room, if you take some of those tips that I have tried to share with you in the short time we have had together, not only can you lean in, you can reach the ambition that you set for yourself, but decide what compromises in life you are prepared to make for that, because compromises there are to be made. If you're married, what about your partner? What about your children? How does that factor in? Can you have it all? Is there a cost to it? What is the price you are prepared to pay? But what can you achieve that you really want? Then take that power to dream. Take that power to have ambition. Take that power to plan. Take that power to lean in and achieve it.